Artificial intelligence and generative AI has taken the world by storm, but so few of us know what it is, how we can apply it in our jobs, and how we can safely use it. In this podcast, we're going to unpack this and so much more. Hey guys, and welcome to the Tech Evolution Podcast. My name is Brian Roach, and joining me today is Veracode's co-founder, Chris Weissopel. Hi, Brian. I'm Chris Weissopel. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder here at Veracode. Yeah, th so thanks for doing this. I have to say, we were talking about doing a podcast or a video podcast like this for so long, and we never get it off the ground. And here we are, like serendipitous. We're just kind of falling into it. We're going to record some videos. And we said, well, hey, why don't we do the Tech Evolution podcast? There's nothing more exciting than generative AI to talk about, is there? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, so like, I know that you've been following this space and I've, I've written a number of, of white papers on this too. And so what I wanted to do is maybe start at a high level and then kind of work our way down where we talk about sure. what is generative AI? Because so many people think that it's new and it's taken the world by storm. We're all paying attention. But like, we really are, if you look at even ChatGPT, just to pick one flavor of it, many versions in, and now the world is starting to pay attention. So let's start high level. Why are people noticing, it was ostensibly GPT-3 and then GPT-4, right? Like why, why now? I think it's because of the generative aspect of this allows someone to ask questions and mm. have a dialogue like it's an intelligent yeah. human, right? Like I think that's the difference. Like, AI with machine learning detecting whether something's a banana or not a banana <laughs> is not that exciting, even though, yes, it can do that. Yeah. Right? We, it can detect all kinds of image detection through machine learning. Yeah, yeah. There's something about the dialogue capability that makes it much more exciting yeah. where you can give it text or even give it a text description and generate images. Yeah. There's something about the conversational and the generative aspect that is sort of enlightened. Uh, Enlightened. It, yeah, enlightening, or it seems like it's... I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure the right word. Well, yeah. It's gotten people excited about the potential. Well, I know that anybody that's watching this is, is waiting for us to get to talk about sentience. Like, when, it is, when is it alive? When does it recognize? When is it thinking? When is it feeling? When does it form its own opinions and perspectives? And I actually think that GPT really was the first time that you could interact with a model where it was exciting. Because I think you were talking about some of the early versions where two objects on a screen and can it recognize a banana like the the way that you interact with gpt which by the way is an interface makes it feel like you're having a conversation with someone well with someone right? exactly and no matter what you're doing if you're a a programmer mm. and you're writing some code and you don't know how to do something and you ha maybe you're doing pair program and you're yeah. asking your buddy uh, you know, how, how would I write a sorting algorithm here? Yeah. How, how, would, how would you do it? Yeah. You don't need that person anymore. You can ask the machine. Yeah. So there's that human feel to it, but, in, in, but you get back answers that are human level intelligence. Yeah. It's very yeah. exciting. You do, and it, and it is. And, and so, let, well, let's maybe talk about the positive. So one positive for me was, I, I use it all the time. It knows all my deepest, darkest secrets. I ask it all manner of questions. Um, but one of the things it did do is it, it, it taught me Python. I got Pythonista on my my iPad. I was like, okay, I'm going to like learn this just because I want to, you know, sometimes stay current. It was your tutor. It, it was my tutor. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. And, and, and I, I think we all started to use it for all manner of things. And I think we're all starting to recognize now that it's trained on a vast amount of content that is incredible in the way that's that it's it has been applied and 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 the interface that's that it kind of it comes with um but let's let's talk about some of the other positive uh sort of applications of it because we know that it's it's been trained on open web content right and when we ask it for coding examples what has your experience been because i certainly have mine so there's a vast amount of code out there on the mm. internet written by millions of developers yeah. all, all around the world. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge corpus to train on, yeah. and there's a lots of great content and ideas in there. The thing that I don't think people who were training this thought of at first and now has become apparent yeah. is there's a lot of vulnerabilities in the average piece of code yeah. that's out there on the internet. Yeah. And so it makes sense, right? Because we there's vulnerabilities in software, we want to find those vulnerabilities and fix them, yeah, yeah. so they're out there. Yeah. Uh, you train on that, and you're going to get a machine that can generate code with vulnerabilities, and yeah. it's sort of like the way the average programmer mm -hmm. would. And, and that's really what we're seeing. There's been a couple of studies done now 
Um, one by some uh, researchers that presented at Black Hat last year, some by some Stanford researchers, and they're showing that the code generated by yeah. generative AI is very similar to the code generated by humans yeah. in, in a, in a, in a, in a bake-off, yeah, yeah. which means they generate about the same number of vulnerabilities. Yeah. So, which is fine, right? As long yeah. as you realize that and as long as you take that into account and you, yeah. don't, you don't trust the machine more than you would trust you know, your, your coding buddy. That's, that's interesting because I know I've certainly been charting this. So from last year, I think because I think we've really been looking at this intensively for probably the last year and a half. And because we have our own generative model and maybe we'll get to that in a second. But one of the things I've noticed is that the way that it produces code and what it produces a year ago wasn't, you know, it would change almost monthly and now it's become even faster than that. So it's interesting that you're saying that it's still producing code that's not secure. Are you still finding that? Def definitely. Now, I think if you trained on a set of code that you really scrutinized for vulnerabilities, you ran it through the ringer of all yeah. the different application security techniques, maybe manual review too on top of that, yeah. and you had a squeaky clean training set, yeah. then I think you could change things. Right. But I haven't seen anyone really do that yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that's a lot of work. And it might actually not be the best solution to the problem of getting to code that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. Yeah. Well, well, let's get that. Like, how are these models actually trained? Like, let's take, um, I mean, we know this Bard out there, but let's take GPT. How it's, it's trained on open web content, right? So it's trained on, on code that's out there, which means it could be trained on code that I've contributed or code that you've shared, right? So it's, it's, totally. it's inherently not secure. Well, it's inherently not secure, but I think you're bringing up another point is, you know, a lot of the code that's been put out there on the internet has a license with yeah. it and a copyright yeah. that is associated with it. There's an intellectual property component where someone says, hey, I want to I want to put out this code for free. Yeah. But and I want people to learn from it. And I want people to use it, but I'm going to put a GPL license on it <laughs> right. because I want the, it to be restricted how it's used. Yeah. And one of the challenges is when someone learns on that code, um, they don't always carry through and keep knowledge that it was GPL right, at, at right. one point in time. So you have some license. So you may be getting a coding example that is basically infringing upon some license because it was trained on that code, basically. Exactly. And this is just one, one aspect of sort of this um, trust and safety aspect mm. of AI is what was it trained on? Right. How, how do I know where that stuff came from? Can I rely on it? Are there other attributes to that, like licensing and copyright, yeah, yeah. that is going to affect me based on the output of that? Right, and I think right. as people have started to use the output of these, these more business type yeah. problems are yeah. starting to crop up. Yeah. Who do you, like who do you think is is going to win, and what do you think is is a better way to produce these models? Because now you have Facebook that's producing their own model, right? We've got many many models that are out there. And I would say that I'm surprised that we're not seeing more because GPT-2 was an architecture that was open source. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it was the last one that was open sourced. Yeah. And a lot of people have been building their models on top of that. So how do you think it's going to evolve? Yeah, I, so I think maybe, you know, maybe the general purpose, I scraped the whole internet to get all the knowledge of humans, yeah. will eventually get better. But we're seeing places where... Um, you're getting a much more trusted and accurate output is when you're training on a smaller data set that is trusted and 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 it, it's been known and it's been vetted. It isn't just a random Reddit post, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, to give an example, um, there is uh, researchers at Harvard Medical School that are training on doctors' transcripts with visits to their patients. Right. So what does the patient say? was the issues that they were having, how did the doctor respond and, and, yeah. re and recommend things. Yeah. And um, that's, a, that's a more trusted data set than just sort of seeking medical device on the, on the internet, right. medical right. advice. Right, right, right. right? Yeah. Um, so we're starting to see smaller, more trusted data sets yeah. perhaps having uh, a bigger impact, even though you can't ask it any question, yeah. but you could ask it a question that a general practitioner might be able to answer for their patient. Right. That's also right. a very important and valuable thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, what we're doing at Vericode is to train some of our products and Vericode Fix is one of our products yeah. 
to fix code, yeah. to generate fixes and um, to, to have a security patch for a security bug, we're training on a trusted data set. Right. We're not trusting on all, we're not training on all the code that someone has purported to fix a bug. Right. We're actually looking at each case and having a small trusted data set. And we found that that ends up being more accurate for that one particular yeah. use case. You yeah. can't ask it to plan a trip to Venice, right? but you can ask it to fix a SQL injection attack. Yeah. So I think we're starting to see that some of these smaller models yeah. that are single purpose have more trusted and valuable output. So wait a second. So, so I do want to get to Veracode Fix because I, I do want to talk about how what we did because we, we have a lot of perspectives and opinions. But before we before we do that, um, when we announced Veracode Fix at RSA conference and the buzz was incredible, right? It was almost serendipitous. Like we we had, had acquired this technology and we'd integrated this technology and we had a, a, an architecture that was producing fixes for common vulnerabilities, but when we see when we say when we said AI, two weeks later everybody was saying AI. Let's level set first and foremost. When you and I say AI, AI, we are talking about the transformer architecture, right? Yes. Minus the chat piece. Right. Right? I think is essentially yeah. what we're saying. Right. Okay. So so ours is based on GPT two. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about maybe the data set because I think we predicated this conversation by saying you know, it, the code it's, that you're getting from some of these models is not secure because it's trained on maybe something that infringes upon a license or maybe it's trained on code that's not secure. So let's go into why do we produce secure fixes for common vulnerabilities and maybe like our, our process and our approach? So really, it's you have to know um, what are the best ways to fix particular vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to vary across different languages, different coding styles. Yeah. Um, but that's something that we have a lot of experience. We know how to do that, right? We know how to do that. Yeah. Like our security research team constantly gets snippets of code yeah. that says, you know, here's a problem in the code. How, how would you fix it? Right. Right. So there's there's not only a volume aspect to there. It's 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 really a, a an accuracy like yeah. you can't. We, we can't give code to our customer no. when we said this is the fix you should be using yeah. and it doesn't fix the code right so um that, that, that's part of the process might be a credibility issue might right? be a credibility yeah. issue so that's part of the process that we've been working with at vericode for many many years when customers ask us how would you fix this code yeah so we have all these examples of how we would fix particular pieces of code right and we're able to take those examples and build it build a training data set yeah. Um, with, with them. And and is it from the is it from our static engine? Is that it, like it it will apply the same uh, fixes that our static engine would would offer as solutions, right? Is that it it it, it, it generally would. So the static engine would 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 give um, guidance. Mm. It doesn't actually give you the exact code. Right. Right. When someone says, "Here's my broken code," can yeah. you can you generate? Uh, the the correct invulnerable code yeah. or, or less vulnerable code if you, right, if right. you want to be more accurate because yeah there's always the chance that there's a new vulnerability introduced when you yeah, change yeah, any yeah. code yeah. but you know how can you what's the best way to fix this yeah that becomes a training set and if you if you want to talk in you know sort of generative AI yeah. parlance the the broken code is the prompt yeah that you're giving to the generative AI right and the output is the fixed code. So if you think about asking a question, you know, uh, please uh, plan me a, uh, a trip to Venice where I visit three great <laughs> restaurants, right? That's the prompt. Yeah, and the yeah. output is the three restaurants, this is right? the second time you brought up Venice. Like maybe, like, I don't yeah. know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm <laughs> you, the AI. You, you, went, you went on vacation, right? Like it's maybe. Actually a pretty good, it's a pretty good travel planner. <laughs> we should um, do the next one there. Okay. But no, so so yeah, so yeah, no. Well, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I guess what I guess what, I, I I guess what I'm saying is, I think the way the best way to understand how it's actually working is the the prompt yeah. is it, when you prompt the AI, the generative AI, you're basically saying, you know, based on your LLM, yeah. based on all your knowledge, what do you predict the answer right. to this to be? What's the what's the best prediction? For what the answer should be because yeah. it's all statistical at, at the end of the day yeah and so this fix becomes the best answer for this broken piece of code or right. this vulnerable right. piece of code right. so it fits into the model uh, extremely well and if you think about it if you're training on a set that is known and vetted and accurate 
um, you're, you're going to get some really good answers. Right. Right. right? It's like you don't yeah. have to worry. Did I get a good answer or not? Yeah. And so, you know, earlier you were talking about, you know, do we ever think like the code generation is, is going to get better? Right. We've trained it yeah. on the world's code. Well, how can how can we do that? I think the real answer is you don't have to make that better. It's already good at generating the code. Yeah. Just layer on an AI that is really good at fixing vulnerable right. code. Right. So I think we're starting to see, and you, you start to see these different uh, solutions chaining AIs together. Yeah. One's really good at this, right. and one's really good at helping the yeah. one that might have a deficiency. And so, you know, I think things like, um, like uh, like Copilot and other code generation tools are very exciting productivity tools. Uh -huh. That's that's great, um, but I wouldn't just put that code into production without trying to fix because, it. Because it, it probably faces the same vulnerabilities, right? It, it, exactly. Yeah. So you you layer on another AI on top of that, and now yeah. you get code that you yeah. can put into production and feel feels much more safe about. Yeah, got it. So I was in I was in London, and somebody asked me. They said, "Listen." Uh, I, I happen to be speaking there. They're like, listen, we, we, you, got, you guys created your own model, right? And I'm like, yeah, totally, we did. And they said, so could you give us some advice? Because we want to we want to create our own. And so we started from the point of view of how does it work, right? And so very simply, like if, if we were to take like that, the tweet line description for how our model works is you feed it code that's not secure, or maybe it is, right? And we don't find any vulnerabilities. But if you feed it code, it's not secure. The transformer architecture essentially identifies that vulnerability and then matches that up with a, well, at the time, it's a patch uh, mm -hmm. uh, file. Um, but now we're going to start doing pull requests. And we should actually talk about that, by the way, too, how the market has evolved from our early access program to now because it's moving at, at, at um, breakneck speed. But um, let's let's talk about the the security research work that went into refining what the model produces. Because one of the things I tell people is the model is going to produce fixes, but they a may not build, b they may not be secure. It, like there's still some. It's not the the magic wand that people right. think it is. No, there's there's Maybe. there's a there's a tuning aspect to this. Yeah, uh, a refinement aspect where you need. You need humans to look at the output and say, "Is this real or not?" I mean, this is the thing. We're we're in this we're in this point of of AI where it's great to ask the question and get the answer, but before you do anything with that information, we're still in the phase where you need a hu human expert to to look at it. The transformer architecture is an implementation for what is our underlying uh, like core competency, which is producing secure code. So, so I get that. Let's mm -hmm. maybe let's maybe transition to some use cases for a second because I, I talked to a lot of customers and a lot of people in the market, and um, they were very fearful a year ago to leverage AI and the IP issues around AI. And I think that the way you've talked about our implementation, our curated data set, which I, mm -hmm. I think is what we would call it, is um, we've created this curated data set. You you give it vulnerable code. We match up a fix, and and that data set has been finely tuned by our security researchers. Let's talk a little bit about IP. Like one of the biggest concerns, both a year ago and now, and maybe more so now, is as people start to understand it, is, well, is my IP going off premise? I think we've answered that question. It's not. We don't train on their code. Right. Your code is is but so let's but let's talk about the IP then that comes out of the models that's being produced. So th this is a big concern um, of 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 where's the IP coming from yeah. to train to train any model. Yeah. And if you think about all the different new AI applications or, or Gen AI applications, we're going to see um, a lot of the value is to train on proprietary models. There's a lot of organizations that get data from their customers their customers' usage patterns, mm -hmm. and they would love to train on those to help those customers again. Right, right. What, but one of the concerns is, you know, my usage of your product and the data I put into your product is, 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 is my crown jewels. Right. It's proprietary to me. Yeah. Like you're, you're a stock trader. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what you've come up with as your trading algorithms yeah. internally. Yeah. Do, you, do you want a, a, a stock transaction system to learn 
your proprietary algorithms right. and then help other right. customers with that, right? right. right? Um, so there's a concern of putting any proprietary data into these systems. Yeah. Um, Didn't we see, we saw this with actually Mid Journey, right? We saw this with Mid Journey where the techniques used to produce the artwork. So for those that don't know, Mid Journey is a generative uh, uh, tool for creating artwork. Right, and so text description. Yeah, so you can give a description, say, you know, give me a cyberpunk scene in 2040 uh, in the style of Van Gogh, right? And right. so there were all these questions around, well, are the techniques inherent in the, the you know, Van Gogh's techniques and, and painting style, is that the IP or is the production the IP? Like, do you think we're ready for this? The, the, as, as I think as every new application comes out, we're gonna, we're gonna have questions about, yeah. you know, is it a medical situation, is it stock trading, is it, is it code? And we're gonna have to wrestle with all those things. I think the important thing though is, that organizations are transparent around mm. where the data is coming from. Right. And they're telling their customers whether or not they are training on their data or yeah. not and, and where the data comes from. That's where you start to get to that ethical and trustworthy yeah. um, AI solution. So I would look to that for any any vendor yeah. who is telling me, Interesting. Um, hey, I'm using AI now to give yeah. you better answers. I would ask those questions. And So your advice to anybody would be, if you're using AI or generative AI, ask questions about how the model was trained, and 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 you'd go into the implementation even. A absolutely, and you know we're starting to do that with actually the vendors we use here at Vericode. Yeah. They come to us and they say, "Hey, upgrade to my new great, you know, AI <laughs> um, version of the product," yeah. and you have to ask, "Where did the data come from yeah. that trains that AI to give me better answers?" and yeah. To, 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 to my the usage whatever of right, my product. Right. And so we're starting to ask those questions. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's gonna be a big dialogue now. It, it yeah. kind of falls into that vendor, it does. vendor it does. supply chain security. I'm sure there's a lot of legal folks listening and watching this saying, oh yeah. man, this is, you know, this is fertile more, ground more for More questions us. to ask. Yeah, so the, the IP then, so the, just let me ask you this, point, this pointed question then. The code that comes out of our Veracode fix who owns that IP? Does that become the customer's? Is it still ours? Is that fragment of code that goes into their application theirs? Or so it belo it belongs to the customer. Okay. It belongs to the customer. Okay. Veracode doesn't have any claims of IP or copyright yeah. to to that to that code. We are creating it for them, just as if a um, you know they asked one of our customer yeah. success uh, people to to answer a question. Yeah. Like yeah. how do, how do I fix this line of code? We don't. You know, it's the same similar scenario. Yeah, good. So we're covered. So, well, I want to go back to RSA conference where we made a a big announcement. Obviously, a Veracode fix came out at the end of the quarter. There was a lot of solutions that kind of pasted the words AI. Yeah. Um, but, but we had an implementation. But we actually had an implementation that we were demoing and showing at, and that's because we've been working on this for a few right. years. It right. wasn't like when ChatGPT no. came out in, in yeah. September, about just about a year ago, we started we took working a weekend on it. And build something. Right, right. Yeah. We had been, you know, we knew this was a hard problem. Uh, we yeah. also knew that this was a problem that had a huge amount of value, yeah. and it was going to take a few years. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that really gets me excited about about uh, Veracode Fix. Um, is actually helping developers. Yes, I feel like throughout my career at Veracode, I've been, you know, calling their baby ugly. I've, yeah. been I've been pointing out things that are wrong with their code, and frankly, the worst part is making them do more right. work. Right. 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 Yeah, like, yeah. like the, the, you know, there's one part saying, "Hey, I'm I'm doing you a favor. I'm making your product safer." But from their perspective, at the end of the day, you're making them do more work. It, it, is, a, it is a great message, right? Because we, we ultimately want them to go faster and, and speed to market is a differentiation for exactly. them. Exactly. And like when we, even when we talk about our, uh, excuse me, our static engines and how we've evolved those, you know, uh, at my coaching to the team is like, listen, we find flaws. We tell you about them right away, and then we look for some more. And Veracode Fix offers fixes for you, right? So exactly, it totally changes the equation from you know just sort of trying to prioritize mm. things more to you know so that they can use their limited time wisely. Yeah. Everyone says about you know please prioritize this stuff, and we've worked hard on that. Yeah. But and, and reducing false pauses, reducing noise. Why are we doing all those things? Because the developers have a limited time to fix things, yeah. right? What's even better 
is making it so they don't need to fix it. <laughs> right. Right. And that's the thing that Just really fix it for it me. Just like, takes like, work yeah. off their plate. Yeah. So that's why Veracode Fix to me is the most revolutionary application security technology yeah. ever created. What? I want to I want to talk about the future by maybe talking yeah. about the past real quick. Okay. Like, do you remember like ten years ago when the mark of a of of your value as a security vendor was the number of vulnerabilities you felt like you, exactly. if you found more than anybody else like we were better we found more right and then it became well but but when you find them does it merit a developer's attention and that was represented as low false positives right and then fast forward to today everyone's like hey man listen I've got like twenty something tools all producing security findings for me but nobody's offering fixes and that's why we created Veracode fix yeah. we didn't want to we didn't want to find yet more problems for the developer we wanted to say you already have enough problems you're already not fixing th some things because you don't have time you're putting yeah. risk into production you don't have enough time we want to take work off your plate we're yeah. going to fix it for you yeah and that is the revolutionary aspect of this, which yeah. I think is really going to change the game. And I don't think there's going to be any security vendor out there which is going to be able to just keep creating more problems yeah. for their customers. I agree. Solve the problems. Don't just find things. Simplify the tools. Solve the problems for me. Give me the easy button. Okay, so that's the now. I want to talk a little bit about the future. I met uh, an old friend of mine at an airport, and he said, uh, listen, our, our, my development teams are are using ChatGPT. You recommend not using it, right? And I'm like, no, no, not at all. No. I think everyone should be able to use GPT. Or we touched on a little bit Copilot, right, to produce code. But the question is, how do you do that safely? And so, if if that was sort of the ten years ago, the past of of software security and generative AI is now our present. What is our future? So, around the AWS reInvent time. Uh, in a latter portion of this year, we're going to enable developers to essentially take code from GPT or Stack Overflow or your friend or wherever you happen to get it from and detect two things. Is the code that you're copying into your, or pasting, excuse me, into your IDE secure? If not, we'll offer a fix for it. And we're going to check to see does it violate that, uh, you know, some some license and has it been trained on code that that it should not have been and you're including that in your in your application, which any of the legal people out there represents significant risk. So uh, that is an exciting future, but let me tell you about another exciting thing about the future. It's not fixing code that is being created that day is great, yeah. right? Because then it that never has a chance to go into production and the developer didn't have to do any work to fix the code. But what about security debt, right? Uh, what yeah. about the code yeah. you've created over the last 10 years? That's a great point. Your product's in maintenance. You only have a few people working on the product. You have no hope of ever yeah. making that product more secure. The people that built it are now gone. The, and the, the people yeah. that built it. Okay. And we found that over time, the security debt increases more rapidly ah. over time as things get older, le less skilled uh, developers working on the product. Yeah. Maybe the product isn't as important, so you can't get right. enough resources to do it. The thing is that application is still important. causing important. risk. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. still important because yeah. you still are hanging, keeping mm. it around. So there's this opportunity with something like Veracode Fix to bulk fix yeah. all the vulnerabilities in your that you you have in your backlog or yeah. is your security debt yeah. we announced veracode fix or at least the early access and we were in early access for a very solid six months because this was new tech it was new ground that we were covering and at that time customers had told us we don't want you automatically fixing our code which is why we arrived at the implementation we did which was okay we'll produce a a, a recommendation in the form of uh, a patch file for you but now, less than two, three months later, Chris, we're seeing customers saying, we trust the model, we trust the machine, we trust what you're producing, just create a pull request and check it in for me. So it almost feels like, um, what was that? Was it uh, iRobot? Was that the movie that Will Smith was in mm -hmm. where we, we rejected robots and they weren't part of our society? It almost, I was waiting to see that play out, but it doesn't seem like that. It, it feels like we've turned the corner, we trust AI, we use AI, we think it's probably a person. It's not a person, but there's more trust in it. And so, do you think that we're going to see over the next, you know, two years, this is going to move at almost exponential pace? I, I think so, but I, I think the thing that um, you used the word scary before, yeah. like, and I, I think that we haven't seen the really scary stuff yet, right? Like, and I hopefully we won't. Yeah. Um, 
but we, we haven't sort of seen the malicious widespread use of this technology. Right. Yes. Right. And but we all know theoretically it's possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're seeing the White House and actually, you know, there's mm. some there's some activity in the legislature talking about we, we have to we have to regulate this now. Like yeah. normally you're like, well let something go wild and we'll regulate it later, <laughs> which is kind of what they did with the the internet. Yeah. And then later with social media, they're like, well let's 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 let it yeah. be pretty free. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but then we saw disinformation and misinformation and, and yeah. manipulation and, and, and actual like social engineering crimes yeah. happening right. on social media, but also just on email and things like that. So, um, and now it's like, well, how do we regulate those things yeah. better? With AI, I think we have to get ahead of it, yeah. right? Because it's moving so quickly and there's, it just seems like more yeah. existential yeah. risk yeah. is happening. So I don't think the way... Let's wait and see, like no, we did with the internet no. and social media, is going to work. Yeah. And so. Uh, so you don't think they're going to let the governments are going to let it run first? And we, by the way, we're already seeing this, right? There's. No, we're starting to see that. talk of like you have to talk about your training data set. Yeah. Right. You have to make something safe and trustworthy and secure yeah. and perhaps watermarked, so we yeah. know where the AI's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, content is is yeah. impacting and yeah. going. Um, and it's not just the U.S. People are realizing this is an international problem. Yes. The U.S. can't solve this alone. Yeah. Um, there in uh, in the fall, there's going to be a uh, international AI summit convened yeah. um, at uh, the place where they built the Turing machine. <laughs> oh, in, okay. Uh, in in uh, in England, which uh -huh. makes sense because yeah, the Turing test Dakota, came yeah, from yeah, that yeah, and, yeah. and all of that. Um, so uh, it, it's a lot of governments around the world. Yeah. getting together saying we need to start talking about this and regulating yeah. this you mentioned it actually so we we saw the executive order you know i mean what was it uh, is it a year ago now maybe it's close to a year but we saw the executive order uh talk about you know more stringency more visibility into what is in your applications it was the ingredients on the side of the box right sure. So do you think that, and obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but from from the, the folks that you're talking to, do you think the government's going to come out, uh, not let this run as long as as the internet did, and and come out and put some mandates in place and some some guardrails around this? I, I think so, and I I think the reason is because um, people are hesitant and even to use the word scared of yeah. a future where this is completely unregulated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I think the fact that the general population has some hesitancy, is a little worried about what it could be. And, and part of that could be some, some from some of the movies of the past where AIs yeah. have run amok um, that, uh, that that something is going to be done yeah. to, 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 to rein it in. Got it. Um, it's a challenging problem, though. Uh, just passing a regulation isn't going to necessarily solve it. No, it's so, not. But it's a start. It's are a people start. motivated to act? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a lot more to watch here. So uh, a couple more questions for you. How do you use AI? How do you use it? How do I use it? Yeah. Well, um, I find that um, my writing style can be kind of dry and maybe a little harsh. <laughs> um, and I often, if I'm communicating to maybe a school administrator uh -huh. or someone like that, I say, Make this a little bit more pleasant and oh. diplomatic. Oh, so the opposite. I see. I do the opposite. Make this less friendly and more formal. <laughs> so um, I, I think I think one of the easy ways to use it in your life is to change yeah. the tone of things, right. make things more humorous, make things more formal. Yeah. Um, and I think it does a really good job. It does. A really good job. It's like that. a language model, right? It's especially good at English. It's especially good at teaching you programming. And Veracode Fix is especially good at offering fixes for common vulnerabilities. Use it for what it's good at, and yeah. we've done that with Veracode Fix. Last question for you. Is it going to take everybody's job? Absolutely not. Absolutely I, not. I, okay. I, I don't think so. Or if it does, it's, it's, it's decades into the future. I really yeah. think it's a force multiplier. Me too. I think if you think about how it's being used in development, people are going to use it to just generate more software. Yeah. As opposed to do the same amount of software with less engineers. Yeah. Because more software means you're more competitive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that it's going to make people more efficient. Um, but I think it's going to be a while before we can take the humans out of the loop. Completely. I think it is too. And I think that we're going to see what we saw with automation and what we saw with ATMs. They created more jobs than not. 
And I think that what it does is it creates a, a, a bigger space for knowledge workers and for everyone else to offer value in a different way. So listen, I, I love this. I can't believe this is our first Tech Evolutions uh, podcast. I think this is... We're going to have to do it again. No rehearsal. Pretty okay. good. We dive right in. Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot more to talk about here. And I think that, I think that I, the net of the answer is here is that there's a way to use this and a way to use this safely. Uh, I think that we should embrace this technology, but do so in a way that's safe. And I think that you've given some great suggestions for people to, you know, ask questions about the models that you're using, look at the code that they are producing, and then you should be able to use it in a safe way. And I think that's what we've done. So that's all we have time for. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, this is our, our inaugural uh, episode of, of Tech Evolution. So thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Roach. And until next time, see ya.